The tribe's foundation for culture comes from the child. The child is everything. They're, they're the gift from the creator. They are life. They are the ones who are going to sustain the tribe. So we didn't even know how many children were actually being removed from homes and put with non-native families. And me personally, I lost a relative because of that. And to this day, I have not been able to find her. Federal law was created because there was a recognition that children were being separated, literally pulled from their communities uh, to the point in which it was considered genocide, and that it really was the deprivation of, of a race and of tribal histories and their presence, and that it was uh, inexcusable, unacceptable, and, and avoidable. And essentially the tribes having no jurisdiction or ability to intervene or to do anything on behalf of their children and their families. The Indian Child Welfare Act is a federal statute that was passed in 1978. It was passed after um, there were studies done and testimony given at the congressional level about the alarming rates of Indian children being removed um, from their homes and being placed up for adoption or out of home placements and normally it was out of the Indian culture. ICWA is the foundation for preserving Indian families and keeping children within the tribes. The core reason that ICWA was passed is because the worldview of tribal culture in raising children and expectations can be very different from the majority culture's view. It gave tribes their recognition of the sovereignty that exists is an entirely different nation within a nation who managed their own tribal affairs, domestic relations, set up their own norms for how children were to be raised, roles of mothers and fathers and extended family and so forth. The federal government adopted the legislation. There were some horrifying statistics about the suicide rate and high alcoholism rate of children that had been forcefully separated from their communities. And it was felt that it is in society's interest to do what is best for the children's interest. And so the federal government adopted this law. Almost 30 years later, you have the federal government coming along and saying to the state of Wisconsin, um, your compliance numbers aren't very good and you really need to do something about it. When I would go into state court and normally my role was to say, your honor, this is what the Indian Child Welfare Act says. And I would have most of the attorneys who were either representing the county or representing even parents say, and what is that, what are you talking about? And I would also have judges say the same thing. I think that when you are a corporation counsel for a county or an assistant DA, you concentrate on chapter 48, which is the Wisconsin Children's Code. We were talking about some of the issues that were going on with our children. One, being taken away. Two, there was no notification to many of the tribes that they even had a child, a native child, within their jurisdiction. The tribes um, and, and a few people from the state started meeting on a regular basis to talk about a lot of issues, what we need to do. And uh, among the things that uh, was on the list that was created was to codify the Indian Child Welfare Act. We decided to do a document, and it ultimately became known as the Seven Tribal Priorities. 
and one of those was uh, the codification. At the same time, the feds had created a new process to evaluate state child welfare programs. During this whole process, when the feds were doing the uh, Family and Child Services Review in Wisconsin, we suggested to the department that this document, the seven tribal priorities, be attached to uh, our response to the federal review. So it's called our program improvement plan. And just to show them that we were doing stuff with the tribes. Well, the feds took that and said, okay, you've attached this to your program improvement plan. So all of a sudden the department had to do something with ICWA. At that point, we, we formed the codification work group with uh, tribes, some state people from a couple of different state agencies, um, James from uh, Judicare. And um, we just, at that point, started a very long process. There are tribal children many times in counties that don't have a reservation or a large tribal presence and they, those county courts may only see a ICWA case once a year, once every five years. So their state personnel, the judge, aren't very familiar with ICWA. And when you have to start from scratch, letting them know ICWA exists, and then educate them as to how that procedural layer interacts with the state law that they're used to, it's a huge uphill battle. And we thought there was a better way to do that. Let's codify it like other states have. The department actually started talking about it and pulling people together, maybe in late 2005, to start working on developing that language with the tribes. There was a lot of interpretation that needed to be done on how the federal ICWA interrelates with the state procedures and the state hearings on child welfare. And it led to a lot of confusion as to how to interweave the state law and the federal law to make sure the intent of the federal ICWA um, was carried out. And that was our project, is to clearly spell that out into state code to ensure that the ICWA was followed. We wanted to make sure that we had a number of disciplines that were involved in this process of uh, monitoring and overseeing the um, uh, WICWA project. So we wanted to make sure that every facet had some input. It's a good thing to have an opposing position because in doing that, if people can get over that it's opposing, you start looking at how better can you build a resolution? How better can you find a solution? Mark and I discussed how this board should be made, uh, who should we get? He was very familiar with other entities that could be on that board. We made the suggestion to the secretary about who should be on that WICWA advisory board. Uh, and of course, the tribal uh, representatives uh, would be and, and were sought out. Well, we knew that ICWA wasn't working in the state of Wisconsin. And so what can we do in order to make a law stronger here? There was a lot of stuff that the codification work group had to interpret. There was, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had developed uh, some guidelines, but they were guidelines, not required, not like a federal rule. Just taking all of the issues one by one by one, and some of them literally spending, you easily spend three meetings talking about one particular issue. So what the Wisconsin tribes did is they took the language and um, added the, the substance to it. This is what we mean when we say qualified expert witness. This is what we mean when we say active efforts. This is what we mean when we say the definition of a parent. It also gave us an opportunity, and this is a common practice, to Wisconsinize any kind of federal statute that a state is now going to codify. So that's exactly what we did. So terms that were very vague, we put um, more meat on the bone or gave it more, a lot more detail so that it meant a lot more and gave people more guidance as to what that term really meant. Also to establish priorities uh, for 
who might be qualified expert witnesses and setting out a hierarchy in terms of who would be first considered in a tier one, tier two, in a descending order. We were asked on numerous occasions to compromise on the existing Indian family exception, and we would not. Um, and it's in the statute right now. There is value to growing up within your native community, to knowing your relatives, to participating in ceremonies, to learning your language. All those have great value beyond monetary value, the square footage of your home. It's recognizing the differences of Native children and the tribe's interests and how to accommodate that, which is truly the best interest of an Indian child, which is different than the general best interest standard. There have been social studies done that Indian children who are taken from their culture and raised in a different culture, do they love their parents who adopted them? Absolutely, but they also know that part of them is missing, something that they don't know. But if you haven't learned who you are, who your family is, what culture you come from, you're left with a hole inside that money doesn't fill. You have to keep in mind that the relations between the state government generally and, and tribal governments was not great. Uh, we had not all that long ago gone through all the spear fishing issues. There was a lot of uh, racism in the state, a uh, lot of lack of trust, obviously, on the part of uh, tribes for the state, and vice versa. So the tribes did trust Mark in the sense that he was a bureaucrat and from DCF and made some sense, but it wasn't the administration that they trusted. For myself, um, looking at that, you know, it's been eight years. It was very, very challenging. Um, I didn't trust the system. The system didn't trust me. So even going into that position in a, a white uh, bureaucratic system, many times I was viewed as a token and as a matter of fact was introduced by one of the state employees uh, program director to another employee that this is our token. Sometimes I have a hard time not getting emotional about this topic because I don't know any Indian family, and I know a lot of them working in Indian country for as long as I have, that haven't had a family member removed. And many times in these families, they still don't know where these people are. It's the first time in a long time that I've ever seen 11 tribes sitting at the same table talking about the same issues that are going on with them and actually standing up and saying, this is going to stop and we have to find a way to stop it. And the way to do that was to do WICWA. It was a lot of work, and I'll tell you what, there were times that we were sitting around the table and we didn't always agree, and yet we were able to understand and know that this needed to be done. So there was compromises, even within the group itself. There were people, key people, um, in the, Department of Child the State Department of Children and Families who many of us trusted and um, felt that they were willing to come to the table with an unbiased attitude, and they were going to be integral in terms of understanding that office and who the key people there were that needed to be brought to the table and also consulted with and become a major stakeholder in all of this that they had an ownership, if you will, for seeing the success of this. And we found those people, and they did stay by our side. And they were there when we were celebrating, and they were there when we were shouting with rage about some of the things and the deception and maneuvering that was being done. Some of the state officials that we work with, and I can just say right off the bat, you know, Mark Mitchell, who was working for the department, was an absolute godsend. 
Mark is a prolific writer. So when we were drafting a lot of this, he was the one who went back. We would sit in a meeting and we would discuss and negotiate and argue and just, you know, lay it all out on the table. And he was able to come back the next meeting and say, okay, based on our previous meeting, this is what I have drafted. And it would really be a true reflection of what we wanted. But it was really a group drafting experience where a lot of the tribal representatives would get together, support one another, uh, relay information and stories to help ensure that we had the strongest draft possible going into the negotiation phase. And some of it was also educating our very useful partner, the state of Wisconsin, on the tribe's perspective and why certain provisions were necessary and why certain language was necessary. And they became a very strong advocate right with us through the process. Or we would actually have assignments and say, okay, the attorney from Stockbridge is going to draft this, the attorney from Ho-Chunk is going to draft this, the attorney from Oneida is going to draft this, and on our next meeting we're going to all come together and look at that language. One of the issues we had with management of the department, I think one of their delaying tactics, was constantly wanting us to rewrite, 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 for, in my view, no apparent reason. Uh, other than to delay the process. So we just did that. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many drafts there were of individual papers on individual issues. Uh, So there was was an amazing amount of mail going back and forth. We ended up with 12, maybe 14 rewrites of certain pieces of what is now WICWA that frustrated everyone to no end. Um, But the tribes kept kept up with the game. Every single change, no matter how minor, was done through the process that we had established. Once we got to 2008, the tribes felt very, very, uh, they believed very strongly that this was the end product, that this is what needs to be introduced. Even though we were at the end of a legislative session, we still wanted to get the bill out there because just getting the bill out there, getting it circulated, um, requesting sponsors for the bill would give us time to go around and educate legislators and lobby for this bill. And so we were sitting in a meeting and um, Secretary Bika came in and basically said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, so you can imagine that was a pretty frustrating point. And we actually sat and had to go back about 10 steps and say why this was so extremely important to the tribes and what we were thinking in terms of strategy. We changed his mind. And so the bill was introduced. As frustrating as it was for everybody, I'm glad it didn't pass because when we went back and and really started working on it again, I think the the end product that we had was much better than the first one. When we started having meetings with the stakeholders, now you have to understand that this was after the tribes had come to uh, a consensus on what the language would be in the statute. This was a point up to... um, where we had the first public hearing, which was in 2008. Senator Jauk was able to uh, recognize the, um, the level of disagreement, you know, upon hearing testimony and that kind of thing during the first hearing. So he, what he recommended was that the people, stakeholders, get together and start having negotiation meetings. Those were the meetings that were very um, uh, excitable. People came with their opinions and their perceptions about the law and what the law meant and how they interpreted certain sections of uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act. Many of them, many, many of them were in agreement that, yes, we need to codify the Indian Child Welfare Act, but we just want to codify it as the federal rule, uh, the federal law. Whatever the federal law says, we'll just put that in the Wisconsin Indian Child Welfare Act. The tribes were very much opposed to it because there was so much discussion in writing the uh, pieces uh, of ICWA 
that needed more description, that needed clarification. Whenever you're doing something and you are really got your heart in it, there's going to be challenges. And there were some challenges. Uh, I don't think any of us that practice in this area are particularly happy with the fact that each tribe can determine eligibility for enrollment on its own. Darn right it would affect it. As well as it has affected our sovereign nation, you have heard the leaders before I speak to that, of the relatives that are lost or still lost when they come back. The legislature likes things that are fairly clean and understandable. Uh, especially on these complicated matters. Number one, this was not a partisan issue. There was nothing Republican or Democratic about it. Uh, but uh, because it was so complex, it was very important that we not leave uh, major groups out of, uh, of the agreement because they could their letters of opposition could end up curtailing all of this hard work that had been done over, the, over almost two and a half years. Adoption agencies, uh, tribes, uh, tribal attorneys, different people that were voicing their concern about the legislation. And that's when, you know, Chalk recommended, you know, these negotiation meetings that went on for almost a year. I think that there were a, a, a probably eight to ten issues that separated uh, separated various groups. Judges had particular concerns. Uh, district attorneys, the Milwaukee Public, uh, the Milwaukee District Attorney's Office had a number of concerns. Uh, social workers had concerns. Counties Association were afraid that some of the changes would Im impose unfunded mandates. I think those who are most frightened by it were the private adoption agencies. And adoptions in that whole industry, it is a business. And it's a very lucrative business. And big dollars are paid for the services of a private agency. It was very clear that while the work groups were moving in the right direction, that the bill that they had proposed might satisfy the Native American representatives, it would not satisfy many of the other groups, which meant that the bill would never pass the legislature. So I felt it really important to commit my committee and my staff and my time uh, to getting the process done and done right by working throughout 2009 to build off of the proposal in 2008. Hundreds of hours, literally hundreds of hours in task force meetings, in one-on-one -on -one meetings were conducted. Well, I made sure that everybody understood that they had an equal place at the table, number one. Uh, that I did not make judgments on whether someone had the right position or the wrong position. It was whether they were paying attention, they were listening to the other side, and they were committed to working towards a, com a compromise. Even the officials we had disagreements with, I think, all come from a good place. They're all concerned about children. They're all concerned about the process. What can be difficult is not always agreeing as to what is in the best interest of a child, what is in the best interest of a tribe. And so what we had to do uh, was use time and empower them through literally hours of conversations uh, either wearing them out uh, or wearing them down, uh, but in the end, including enough of their ideas to the point that they felt as though that they were able to accomplish as much as they could accomplish. But at times during this process, uh, it was important to put my hand on the table and say, baloney, let's remember why we're here. And, uh, and, I, and I think they, they went back to work. And by God, over time, I think they realized, all parties realized, that they were part of a process that was moving towards accomplishment, their goal of codifying the Indian Child Welfare Act. And we made it a bill that was more practical. And I think if we would have gone sooner without that process, without hearing everybody's concerns, without the state hand in hand moving forward with the tribes, we may not have gotten the bill through. 
each of us has a responsibility to care for children, not just our children, but all children. It is the mark of our responsibility. Uh, we wish for our children to carry on our name, our traditions, and our cultures. We want them to connect with us, our values, and our beliefs. Senator Jauk, who was the main sponsor of the bill, kind of devised the, um, the joint hearing. So it was, you know, the senators and the um, assembly representatives. And so it was a large bunch of state representatives who we had to testify in front of. And so as a work group, we organized it and we organized into different topics. The tribal leaders started the hearing um, by talking about the history and the need. And so that was so very significant um, because we're talking about tribal leaders who really lived this. Um, we had um, J Judge Whitefish from uh, Forest County Potawatomi who actually grew up in foster care talk about his experience. I was placed in foster homes, seven of them. How would you like your child to go to seven homes? We had um, President Cleveland, who was president of the Ho-Chunk Nation at the time, talk about um, relatives and people that he knew who were removed from his fam their families. They would be either adopted or placed with farm families and not really treated as members of the family, but rather um, treated as labor for on the farm. And then we had Mark Tilden, who's an attorney, or was an attorney with NARF, the Native American Rights Fund. He actually came and testified at the joint hearing, which was very um, favorable and a very generous thing to do. One of the main issues of contention has to do with the timelines by which a child welfare proceeding has to move to what they call permanency. We definitely had um, Le uh, members of the legislature that had a lot of concerns and were less educated on the tribe's worldview and the need for ICWA and the important role that the tribe's expert witness plays in that proceeding. Many of them had absolutely no clue of what this act was. Um, many of them didn't even know that there were 11 tribes in the state of Wisconsin. So we really had to start from you know, step one. It is an unnecessary law. That's my initial statement. It was a very personal attack to sit there after three years' work and hear those same arguments that really led to the beginning of the project and the need for the bill in the first place. The Indian Law Section and the Children of Law Section within the State Bar of Wisconsin was also going through a process because they have a process where the Indian Law Section wanted to support this bill and the Children of the Law Section didn't outright oppose it, but they were just saying just the plain language of the Indian Child Welfare Act should be put in Chapter 48 and nothing more. It shouldn't be Wisconsinized. Nothing more should be in it than that. And we said no. That is not what happens with federal statutes, if you look at anything. But there were actually hearings within the State Bar of Wisconsin that we had outside of the legislative process. Some of those, I remember one hearing was very heated, where I had one of the attorneys from the Children of the Law section come about three inches from my face um, and, you know, and raising her voice. We had lobbyists who were there to... Uh, beat the halls and knock on the doors and that. We relied on the lobbyists for their knowledge of the interworkings of the legislature and their knowledge of the individual legislators and the drafting team provided the specific knowledge on ICWA child welfare proceedings and the content to help back up the lobbyist effort and together I think we're a very effective team. They knocked on the right doors for us to get in, you know, had meetings and discussions with some of the legislators that we felt were going to be the toughest opponents of this bill. It was convincing some of the congressmen and senators stating, this is what we need to do for our children. There's a federal law that has not been adhered to here in the state of Wisconsin. We have not passed. In, in fact, we failed. So we want your support on this law. So I believe that it was just a perseverance 
and the dedication of the people who helped. Not only the 11 tribes, but some of the people that worked for the state too. The stakeholders were doing a lot of lobbying as, as were we. And so we were constantly getting calls from legislators asking some of the most inane questions because, based on what they were told by the stakeholders. So we had a process where um, I would, if we got the call, I would send an email out to Chris, Dennis, um, Carolyn, Rob, and say, okay, this legislator is asking this question, we have to get back to him today. And, and I, in some cases I would suggest a response and then they'd email back saying, okay, or no, change this. The tribes did an amazing job in terms of getting to, I think, every legislator in both houses. So um, the process wasn't just writing the bill. It was getting the bill passed. We heard Representative Taylor give her explanation. We had Senator Jauk um, speak to it. In the Senate, there were maybe two or three senators who we thought were going to possibly oppose this, um, and they didn't. Lena Taylor from Milwaukee, who in a very few words just sort of told her colleagues that they probably don't realize the historic significance of the vote that they were just going to take. And that was pretty cool. But when, when both houses passed it unanimously, I was kind of floored because part of my job was working in the legislature and nothing passes unanimously. For a three-year process, it seemed to go really fast at the end, and it was really unbelievable that we could get the vote of every legislator for our bill when there was such still strong opposition um, voiced by the adoption attorneys, some of the district attorneys, and we really felt that there were going to be some dissenting votes. It was a real rush um, to know that it passed, you know, unanimously. I guess that was the most um, exciting piece of it. Very, very breathtaking in American government. For Rick would have worked, it's, it's more than changing the law. We put a lot of effort into training, developing of resources. Because with, you know, if judges and social workers and other folks don't know the law or don't understand the law, it doesn't matter how good a job you did writing the law. We um, applied for and received the project with the Midwest Implementation Center at the University of Nebraska to help us start doing stuff. And that, that formalized the whole process considerably. So a, a lot of materials were developed. When we do our training, our training now that we did in conjunction with, with the MICWIC project, um, that emphasizes a lot of the history so that people know that this is why the, the statute was passed in the first place. Loa Porter was primarily responsible for creating this flowchart uh, for judges and, and other folks about what they have to do. The state court's office has just recently also come up with a judicial checklist so it's a two-page document that a judge can look at and actually look at the different factors and check off, was this done, was this done, was this done? We did a series of two, three, four-hour trainings, depending, but just to try and get to as many people as possible, primarily social workers, but also judges. I end up educating judges, I end up educating assistant district attorneys, I end up educating corporation counsel, um, I end up educating guardian ad litems on, you know, what this law is and the components of it and the particular components of it. Um, so that's a constant. You can't apply the law to an Indian child if you don't know the child is an Indian. And that has been one of the problems forever, is nobody even asking. So we don't know how many kids we lost over the years because we didn't know they were Indian. All of these things are so important. We, don't, we didn't create this whole process step by step by step by step to just have it go for naught because no one bothered to ask if this was an Indian child. So that was a very important part of the training. 
My advice for other tribal attorneys trying to codify ICWA in their state uh, is perseverance. Build a broad coalition and persevere. It will take many years. You will hear a lot of the same arguments. It will be personally offensive. It will be frustrating. But it can also build a greater community. Good legislation, especially on complicated issues, takes time. It takes uh, the willingness to seek common ground with a common purpose. One of the things that I would say is, you know, take a look at the other states, because we certainly did. Iowa had done a codification um, fairly recently, so we did look to their um, efforts. Minnesota, long before, had the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act um, that codified parts of ICWA. You have to focus on the process, because we wouldn't have gotten where we got in terms of the quality of the product, I think, if we didn't have a process that allowed that to happen. And, uh, you know, in, in that I mean including you know, who is at the table, uh, taking your time to develop the trust, that's absolutely critical. And then sticking together once you're done. But it's also critical that the people the tribal people understand their own government and who the key people are within that structure and who they need to approach and in what manner to get a buy-in. Give people an opportunity to be at the table. Give them an equal voice even though they have diverse voices. Encourage them to listen and not just talk at each other. And remind them that compromise is not a four-letter word. Uh, it isn't a sin, it, isn't, uh, it is a valuable result when people decide that they're going to uh, reach out and work hand in hand, not clenched fist to clenched fist. I think the passage of the bill uh, represented a very proud moment to tribes who believed that it recognized that they are entitled to have a future and not just a past. It was the recognition that this piece of legislation is so important, it is so significant that we agree, Wisconsin, that it needs to be in our own law books so that children can receive all those protections so that they can be raised in tribal families so that they can maintain their culture and their identity and be productive people in both of, in two societies. This is legacy legislation because it will make a true uh, improvement in the opportunity for children and families along into the future. We always said in Ho-Chunk that we would never have a child that doesn't have a home. They're finally listening to us.